Good evening and welcome to the February 22nd, 2021 Ordinance Review Committee. The meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. First up is the roll call. Laura, can you do the roll call, please? Sure. Councillor Thorpe. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. Member Peck. Here. And Member Napolitano. Here. Okay. Thank you. Next up, we have public comment. Laura, do we have anyone? It's just Jackie Balance I saw in the waiting room and I think she, she's the only, and Councilor oh, Jarek. Jackie. So okay, two. so I'll do my little spiel. We will begin as always with public comment. If you know you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. To raise your hand, you click on participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column will open with the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of the column. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I will do my best to monitor that for people having technical difficulties, but that is the only purpose for which we will use that function. And it will only be used during public comment. I will unmute each hand, raised hand one by one and ask if you would like to make a comment. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for public record. We do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. All participants will need to be muted until called upon. I also ask that all of the committee members turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the committee members and only the person recognized has the floor. We will do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that is inappropriate. I'll also remind people that we are always happy to receive comments by email, which are equally part of the public record. So please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. And no, no raised hands. Oh, there is Jackie Balance. Okay. Okay. Unmute and start video. Um, let me see. Last November, there was a, a development in my own neighborhood that brought my attention to the intersection of sustainable and affordable and equitable housing with the city regulations. Since then, I've been learning about building codes and zoning laws and how the city government works. It's been, it's been a learning curve, let me tell you. Um, and that brought me to your last meeting. I just sat in to see what you were talking about. And I was very moved what, by what Citizen Puck had to say about racial discrimination in housing and how housing policy affects disparity in housing accessibility for marginalized communities. And since I've been brainstorming with friends and neighbors about possible pathways to more equity and affordability in new home construction, I shared a couple of those ideas with you by email already. The fit provision of the current zoning law has some potential if it had teeth but applying the FIT concept actually turns out to be in alignment with the plan for a resiliency and regeneration point system site plan review that um, our esteemed guest, Wayne Feiden, um, is responsible for. And I also know that we can't limit the size of new homes by right, but we have a possibility to set a lower size to trigger the site plan review, especially if there's a resiliency and regeneration point system in place. So I'm just here to listen and see what I can learn and hope that our city solicitor can even help us to find a path that will work to increasing affordable housing, equity in housing, resiliency in housing. <sighs> And um, that's, that's my piece. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And just, I, I, you know, I know you're Jackie Balance and you live in Northampton, correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Any other hands? Seeing none, we will now close the public comment. And we will move on to the approval of minutes of January 11th, 2021. Do I have a motion, please? It's a motion. Motion made by Councilor Barr, seconded by? 
Second. I'll second. I right, so heard um, Member Paik make the second. Any discussion changes? Megan, I can't see minor you. ones. Okay. Just um, end of a sentence that was dropped. I think page six. I'll send all this over to Laura. Very Great. minor. Just. Mama Peg says she doesn't need to convince anyone about racial disparities in home ownership. So those last words were dropped. Um, oh. Again, and then there's another sentence like zoning, zoning ordinances can enable home ownership. So I think Laura's got a hand up. I think those are corrections to the February 1st, which aren't actually on the agenda for approval. Am I right that that was the ones I just yes. sent out today? Yes, uh, you're right. So, yeah. so you can actually send them, you know, um, yeah, I don't actually have them I'm on. just getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> I'll so, come back next next meeting. See what I mean, Megan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, you're point. welcome to finish it. I, any, any discussions on. on the January 11th agenda uh, <laughs> meet, meeting? Uh, <laughs> Megan? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, hmm. Okay, so <laughs> Boy, I really did not <laughs> enjoy reliving this meeting. It was a long one. <laughs> but we're not here for our help. So this is, um, there were a couple of, um, there, you know, okay, so there was a point um, at which I lost my audio. Yes. And, um, I gave an impassioned speech that I won't bore you with, <laughs> but um, should I summarize or? Yeah. Since I would actually, actually like to add that to the minutes some way. This is really strange to, to talk about kind of <laughs> out of context, nearly a month later, more than a month later, but um, um, okay, so there, page three, um, I wanted to see, felt that Attorney Seawall thought uh, very controversial the mention of um, systemic racism in, in our report. Um, he had questioned how directly that was related to review of ordinances. And I just wanted to point out again that this committee, 2020 um, committee was formed out of a, an amendment to a, a council resolution that has systemic racism in the title, a resolution in support of actions to combat the public health crisis of systemic racism. Um, and so because of that I ref I referenced that um, a paragraph later in the executive summary when I say, uh, you know, although laws are written to be impartial, they may have disparate impacts on marginalized populations. Structural causes of systemic racism may include, but are not limited to, residential segregation, intergenerational wealth and equity, and equal educational opportunities, barrier specific participation, implicit biases, and discrimination. So. That's the reason intergenerational wealth equity inequality came up so much in our discussion on January 11th. And I, you know, and I agree that public the education, community education is not our direct, a direct objective of this committee, but it is, um, it is an important indirect objective because everything we do is for public consumption, including our report. Okay, and um, just, and then there were just a couple of things that I thought should be capitalized. Um, so member Peck, are we, are you making I'm changes? Sure. 
to the minutes of January 11, 2021? You're gonna? Yes. Okay, so Laura, I'm not sure if we, Laura, you have your hand raised. I was just wondering if she was proposing the insertion of certain specific sentences in a particular place mm -hmm. in the minutes. Yes, and I'm guess. sending this to okay. you. Very good. I just have to read this all up. So okay, great. So it's, it's um, um, so um, there was one sentence that was dropped. Member Peck wondered if the committee was interested in talking about barriers to civic participation and other causes of systemic racism. She wasn't sure if there are ordinances related to that and this was also in the charter review committee's report as a topic of further study that's what i wanted to add um, i so, will and so also should we, should we continue with discussion around the january 11th approval of minutes or should we continue this so give you time to send this to laura so she can make those changes and then present to us at a, at a at the next meeting. I don't, does this sound substantial enough that we can approve them tonight? I, 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 mean, I mean, it sounds a little substantial to me. I'm not sure how Laura's getting everything down, but it- Yeah, I Laura's mean, I, I usually, I usually just make the corrections on the minutes and submit them to her after right. I share them with the committee in the meeting. I could then show them in red line, you know, so everyone can see what the change is, specific changes are and put them on again for approval at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a, Councilor Nash. Yeah, and with the added um, uh, opportunity for member Peck to actually read those additions in during our discussion next time, because I, I, I feel like, there, there's two things here that what she said is not it reflected in the minutes and that it wasn't reflected in our discussion because her audio cut out. So that um, I think that that would be a fair way to handle it, that they be inserted. And then next time when we deliberate that, um, that we hear the, the words that got cut out. Does that sound fair? Okay, okay. So we can, so I, I'm thinking Council Nash, we need to vote to have this move. So I think we have to, uh, so whoever made the motion can withdraw the motion. I'm gonna withdraw it. Thank you. And the second would need to withdraw the second as well. Second was, was um, Member Peck. So. Okay. And so I would like to make a motion that we uh, we table voting on this till our next meeting, where the uh, remarks can be added into the the minutes. Second. Okay. And I believe we need to take a vote on that, Councilor Nash. On that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay. I'm um, Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Member Peck. Yes. And Member Napolitano. Yes. Okay. Moving on next in our agenda, we are going to discuss the census data on disproportionately impacted communities in Northampton. And I'm happy to have this discussion with the Office of Planning and Sustainability Director, Wayne Fiden, who is joining us this evening. So I see Wayne is present. I don't see him on my screen though. Mr. Fiden? I'm here. Hi guys. How are you? Good. So, Thank you for being here. No problem. I, I wasn't exactly sure you wanted. So in some ways I just have a teaser of data and then sort of can share data sources and I'm happy to spend more time in it if I didn't want to go down a dead end. Um, so can I, is it okay for me to show you a few slides of data that we have to sort of get Discussions going and picking what's useful. Laura, yes. can you make me a co yes, make you a co host? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll run through this quickly again. This is really just sort of more, more to get you going and, and thoughts, and frankly, data points that we already had from other presentations. Um, so, do you all hopefully see that on your screen? Yes. 
So, you know, it's really easy, and this is the data we have already, it's really easy to do very simple analysis of, you know, the, the straight demographics, right? So we're an older population of the nation as a whole. Um, New England is older than the nation as a whole, and we're even older than New England. Um, same thing goes, we have a, a four more female population, even when we back out the population of Smith College. Um, we have a, have a more female population. Again, it's partially because we're an older population, right? So some of us in this room are at the age where we start dropping like flies um, and men drop faster than women. So, you know, you have an older population, almost by definition, you have a more female population, but we are still more female, even backing out people over 65 and backing out Smith College, we're still a more heavily female population, population level. Um, again, much wider than this isn't, than the nation as a whole, much less diverse. Um, I didn't run this for Massachusetts or New England. So again, you know, Massachusetts is the, is the widest section of the country or among the widest sections of the country. Um, and if we'd done this for our school system, right? So this is because this includes a lot of people in my age demographic. Um, we are particularly white. If you did kids under 18, we're a much more diverse community. Um, and that's both because we're, you know, the nature of, of who's going to school and changing who goes to public schools, et cetera. Um, so again, this is just for the, the city as a whole and the population. Um, and here's where we start in terms of some of the, the, the interesting questions from my standpoint. So we have a lower home ownership rate than the country as a whole. That's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective, right? So. The United States, the most heavily subsidized social program in the country is um, home ownership, right? Because we, we let you deduct both your property taxes and your mortgage, your mortgage interest. So huge amounts of, of federal dollars going into, and as well as Fannie Mae and Jamie. Mae. You know, so you all probably know this history, but um, so huge interest in creating home ownership. Um, but of course, home ownership leaves out a lot of the population people who um, don't have the money either because they earn too little or they're just too young and haven't accumulated assets. Um, the way I look at this is the risk, I don't have this in the chart, but the risk is less the raw number and more the change, the delta. So we used to be about 51% when I got to Northampton, 51 home ownership. So there's over 30 years, it's dropping slowly, but it is dropping. Um, we're losing people and this is both, um, we're heavily a city of, of single family homes and we've had some condominization of rental apartments. So, so this is you know, one of the concerns we've had. Those of you who are in council know the work we've been doing on the, the two family homes by right, which is very much to count this piece. Um, Just to clarify, so Nat, compared to the national average, we're below what we're, uh, everybody else is in terms of home ownership? That's correct. Right, because we have more rental, you know, we're a college community in part, and so we're going to have more rent. I mean, you'd expect the nature of, you know, the more urban generally, I'm simplifying right. a little bit, this may not apply in Houston, right. but the more urban you are, the more rental you are, right? So the rate of home ownership in New York City in Boston yeah. is going to be, you know, very different than it is here. Um, and so we're, we're really, even though we're a tiny community, yeah. We're, we are a city, and so you'd expect, you know, some of our demographics is a suburban area, which is heavily home ownership and heavily single family home, and some is more urban. I, I'm just surprised. I, it's, I just hear from people how difficult it is to get an apartment, yet, you know, 45% of our housing is rental. It, yeah. It's, anyway, yeah, thank, yeah. keep going. To get an affordable, affordable rental. Yeah, and then there's the affordable on top of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. then there's yeah. just renting. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's like twelve point five percent, I think, is of our units are affordable the way the state measures it, which are subsidized units. So it doesn't you know, there may be other units that are market rate affordable, but twelve point, I think, it's four percent are affordable. Um, so this is an interesting one. This is this this affects us for the work that you're doing. This is good news and bad news. So more retail dollars, this is pre-COVID, more retail dollars are spent in Northampton than the average around the country. Um, and that reflects a lot of things. We're a county seat, so people to the north and west of us in particular 
um, come drive to Northampton and spend their retail dollars. So that's always been good. It's a good part of our economy. Um, but it also highlights the vulnerability, whether it's Amazon, the, you know, the long-term trend towards Amazon or the short-term COVID trend. This is part of the reason Northampton is being more hard hit by COVID than many communities, right? Between colleges not being a session and we rely on these retail sales. Um, you know, we're, so good news that people are spending money, but bad news that it makes us more at threat, particularly as it relates to social equity. Um, retail job, retail and service. This is just about retail, it's not service. But retail and service tend to be relatively low paid jobs. You know, so these are non-professional jobs. Um, so we're gonna have a greater percentage. And, and, and I don't have that in these charts for service industry, but we could do the same thing. We are gonna have a greater percentage of our workforce and lower income jobs, right? So we have UMass jobs, we have Cooley Dickinson jobs, we have other professionals, but we have a lot of people in, in the sectors. Um, and then it's just a chart I happen to have. So I, I apologize, this actually I grabbed this Hampshire County, not Northampton. Um, we could do the same thing, but um, you know, our median household income um, is higher than the nation as a whole, but lower than Massachusetts. Now that's not all bad because you know, Massachusetts includes Boston and, and higher rent areas, but that's been pretty steady. Pre-COVID, pretty consistently, our median income was on the low end, but our unemployment rate was also on the low end. We, have a, we had a lot of relatively stable employment, so we were less um, cyclical, right? In good economic times and bad economic times, we were underpaid, but we had fewer people unemployed. COVID hit us uniquely worse than the people. Um, poverty rates are a similar story. Our poverty rate is lower than most Massachusetts cities and higher than almost every Massachusetts town out there. Um, so we're, you know, we're almost exactly what the country is. Um, and then the cost burdening is of course what we always focus on, right? So it doesn't really matter what our income is compared to Boston, what matters is who, can, who does, spends more than 30% of our income. So half our population spends more than 30% of their income um, on housing. Again, Boston and San Francisco will be higher because people earning $100,000 might still be cost burdened. Um, is the can I just ask? Is the income uh, considered there? Is that presumably gross income, not not like take home? Presumably, yes. Yeah. Um, I, that's my understanding. It's a good question. I believe that's correct. Um, um, and again, you know, all these figures. So this remember these are these are Hampshire County, but we're going to be pretty similar for for Northampton. Um, it's out there. Um, the other thing that affects us, I don't have good numbers on this, we'd like to get it, is people in my world have always talked about 30% of income being cost burden, 50% being severe cost burden. We're seeing more and more focus on income plus transportation cost. Because in Boston, your rent's high, but you're more likely to take the Metro or the, the MBTA. Out here, you're more likely to have to own a car. And so that may be a more honest evaluation of of poverty because it's hard to survive out here without a car. Unfortunately, I haven't so far at least found good numbers for that. I'm sure they're out there. Out there. Okay. And then, you know, homelessness, this is actually relatively recent data. This is, is data that um, Community Action collects as part of the continuum of care. Um, it, but obviously this is again, pre-COVID. Um, so, relatively few unsheltered people, although it's still significant, and it's probably gone up a lot, and a much greater population of sheltered. Remember, Massachusetts is one of two or three states in the country where people have a right, children have a right to housing. So we're gonna have fewer unsheltered children in Massachusetts than we will in most other states, um, but otherwise. So small numbers, obviously during COVID, it's highlighted how significant this small population affects our, our resources and, and demand. Um, and then not surprisingly, um, discrepancy in um, who, who is homeless and who isn't. So if whites are almost 88% of the population, non-Hispanic whites are almost 88% of the population, they're only 58% of the homeless population. Um, and this is for Hampshire County, not just Northampton. This is all right. Hampshire. That's correct. And that's the way the state is collected. Okay. So the earlier chart was just, I was, 
that's the one I have, but this zero, that's the way we collect this data. Okay. This includes the, this includes the a population that migrated to Northampton from Hampton County and Berkshire County over the past year? No, because these are, this data is from January of 2020. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so I don't have more recent data out, out there. Um, and, and the other reason we like the Hampshire County, frankly, is the homeless population doesn't move long distances. You know, we don't, we create a, open a homeless shelter. We don't attract people from Boston, but we do attract people from the county. You know, the homeless population in Amherst, Northampton, for example, sort of moves back and forth. Um, and Holyoke, as you know, doesn't have a shelter. I know they were setting one up during COVID. I'm not sure where they are in the piece, but. Mm -hmm. Brian, I had my hand up for a while. Um, I want to go hard. back a little bit here. Yeah. Um, what is our poverty rate in our city of Northampton? Would you have a reading on that? It was about 15%. Again, this is, you know, there's always a lag in the data. Um, and the American uh, Community Survey, which is where most of the data comes from, is not like the US Census. It doesn't get everybody, but 15% is pretty close. That's the figure we tend to use. 50% in our 50, city? 15%. Oh, 15, I wasn't going to Okay. Okay, so then it just, we can generate other data. So this is really just teasers. This happens to be done through, did for a different purpose, but we heard lots of people talking about you know, street trees and who is street trees and who doesn't. Um, and not surprisingly, there's gonna be more trees if you live in a rural area than an urban area. We ran it in reverse. We ran impervious area, right? Because if we're, because one of the hot issues these days is where do we encourage development, where we discourage development. If we discourage development in urban areas, it goes out to the suburban areas, there's a certain demand. And so this is just how much square footage do you have, it happens in meters, but how much square footage you have of impervious area, area where the water can't go into the ground. And not surprisingly, the more rural the area in Northampton, the more paved surface per person, right? So rural places have, are greener, there's more trees, but people have bigger driveways, people have bigger houses, people are more likely to have pools. So in fact, we don't have it. The only reason I show this chart, besides the fact it's very relevant for, for equity and, and is driving some of the zoning changes they're working on is we have some data available from the city census um, and from other sources which we can break down to smaller areas. So most of what we're talking about when you use American Community Survey is citywide data. Some of the data is available at smaller geographies. Um, you know, some stuff is confidential, so we don't have but, you know, for example, we have the city census. We know where every single person in the entire city lives, including people under 17. We can map publicly where that is for people over 17. And we can map under 17 as long as we crowd it together. Like by precinct, by ward, by zoning district, I can tell you how many people live there who are under 17. I can't do small geographies because that's confidential data. So depending on what you're interested in, we can do some of that data. Um, and now your census data, does, is it including those who are houseless or not? So the city census does not. Okay. Um, there is a point in time survey that's done. Um, that's what you saw that January 2020. The point in time survey is a cold day when we expect, when this is set up by the census department and it's run locally. Um, on a cold day, we expect as many people to be housed as possible. Then they go out to known homeless encampments. Mm -hmm. Um, actual surveys, so 100% surveys, which is the city sur survey, the U.S. Census, and the homeless point and count, by definition undercount, because they don't do any projection for missing people. American Community Survey, in some ways, can be more accurate because it's doing representative samples, and so they can say we know we're missing certain populations. We're going to try to fill in the blanks for them where they are. But so. When I give you a number about homeless, it is absolutely going to undercount the person who stays far away from social workers and far away from the state. Okay. Um, so then, you know, there's lots of, there's an unbelievable amount of demographic information that's out there. I didn't know exactly what you wanted. The stuff that's harder to get 
is the so-called cross tabulation. So I don't know how many of you play with numbers and don't. So, you know, finding the number of people who are Latino is pretty easy to get. Finding the number of people who are Latino and housing burdened and restaurant workers. That's the cross tabulation, right? You, you're trying to figure out people because a lot of that's limited. We only get the cross tabs on what the census department does for us. And a lot of those cross tabs aren't there. So even though I can tell you exactly what they tell us we have for Latino populations, I can't tell you the same thing for Latino populations and X. Um, so I, I saw you all have this. I'm not sure this is nothing new. This was in your, um, uh, I'm not sure this is going to show up for you, but so um, the American Community Survey, this is the link that Laura had in the agenda. Yes. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's the best source of cross tabs out there, um, of cross tabulations. So it, it's, it's the good data that's out there. Again, very limited. It's not going to give you everything you want. It's sort of a gold standard, but at least it's the best standard there is. So not not perfect, but it's the data that everybody's using. Thank you for that. I see Councilor Barge has her hand up. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Wayne, looking at this list, I mean, all our pictures are there and I can't get the whole reading on that right hand side, but I would like an explanation. Um, veterans from the year of 215 to 219, what is the outcome on that? I can't see it. Because all um, our pictures anyway, are covered yeah. with that. So I'm not sure which one you're at. You're on this um, the American Community Survey piece? Nope, yeah. we're looking at your raw data. There's no column heading. There's no column heading, she's saying. Right. She, so she doesn't know how to interpret the 1,085 and the 18 million. Nope. Um, sorry, I'm just back. No, the previous it. one. No. no. It's, yeah, thank it's you. Right there. Yeah. OK, what my question yeah. is, um, Two or more races per cent. What do you mean by two or more races? So the, 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 the US census until 20 years ago required you to choose a class. You could be white, you could be Pacific Islander, you could be Asian, you could be African, period. They decided it doesn't reflect what America is. And so they started saying, you can check off a box. You can say, I am a black Pacific Islander. I am, you know, because you have mixed parentage. Um, many people are, are, are of mixed race. You can't compare more than 20 years ago because the census didn't ask that. So 4.2% of our population is saying, I'm, I am some combination, white, Asian, Native American, you know, checking those boxes. Re remember that the way we classify the United States, I mean, you know, obviously race is an artificial construct, but the way we classify this, we, we do not consider Hispanic and Latino a race. So when we talk about two or more races, it's something other than Hispanic, and then over and above that, we say, are you Hispanic or Latino? So it is a, you know, it's an artificial construct, but we know that white alone is sort of the, that's the dominant population, particularly in the women. So yeah, and I put down that I'm Greek and Portuguese on everything that I marked. Right. But the census doesn't, you know, the census doesn't give you a chance for that. So by the census, you're oh. a white location, period. Uh -huh. um, and I, let me just do one, put one other thing up quickly. So this is just the other, um, if I'm just go back, I have too many screens up, I apologize. Uh, sorry, I lost my American Community Survey. But... All right, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to bore you in that piece. Um, but, you know, so, so the American Community Survey, I certainly can dig any information or you can, you can play with it yourself. It's pretty easy to use um, as long as you know what it is you're, you're looking for in the process. Um, right, let me just... Remember? And Wayne, if I'm not mistaken, you you pretty much, I think you covered the census data and the equity considerations that we had on our agenda. If, can I go, can I have a few more minutes to yep. show you a, a piece? So, oh yeah, um, I did 
couple of the slides on here. Again, these are sort of just grab for doing it, but obviously we focus on this a lot in, you know, we, we often think about wealth creation, right? What's the median income? And we also focus on the inequities and health. This is just as a country, so I grabbed somebody else's slide out here. But so, you, so if you think about other countries that are richer or poorer than us, they may have more difference between the richest and the poorest. Um, Northampton is actually not that bad. We don't have a huge underclass, right? Only 15% of our population is below poverty level. And we don't have a huge class of people earning more than a million dollars. So we actually have less inequity in Northampton than we do than we may have as a country than, than other parts. Um, but just think of that just median income, you know, only tells you half population earns more, half earns less. And so people use this Gini coefficient as a as a measurement to try to measure the health inequity. And I won't go through this. This goes back to the conversation I heard you say earlier today. Again, I happened to teach a class on this, so I'm stealing one of my slides. But, you know, when we talk about structural racism, we talk about, you know, deliberate policies that we had for many years, we as a nation had for many years, which deliberately treated different groups differently. The one I highlighted here is about zoning, right? So the first case to go to the Supreme Court about zoning, um, zoning was upheld because the Supreme Court Justice Sutherland, who was very conservative, thought that apartment homes are parasites, that renters are parasites in the country. So, you know, when we think about the, the, what does it actually mean when we apply things, we're sort of focusing on this. And then I, I won't go through over this, you all had I think, the, the reference to our website, but for planning office, we've been trying to say, well, equity, everyone talks about a lot, but there's five aspects of equity that are really important to us. And we're trying to, to pay attention to this. And this shows up in odd ways. So, you know, Northampton is negotiating with Amherst and Pelham for community choice aggregation. This is a system where we buy the electricity jointly. City Council has authorized us to go forward in this piece. And we're just debating what are the voting rules out here? And Pelham says, well, one town, one vote. If it's one town, one vote, then you can guess we're gonna have towns that are, don't necessarily represent us. And they said, oh, but, but the core principle is equity, so it's okay. We're going to represent equitable interest. And we look at this list and say, well, that's not really procedural equity. You know, we don't really think white middle class people should be representing the positions for everybody else in the community. And so we're not really getting procedural equity. So this becomes sort of the, the test we put things through. Um, and, and this is my last slide, but as you all know, so this is the, you know, what does this mean in action? So there, um, several zoning packages working their way through city council now. The first one is the two family homes that comes for a vote at your next council meeting. Other ones are coming before your different committees. And they're all at some point, this direct outcome of what we mean by, by what does equity mean in the trenches, right? So we know that renters have been underrepresented um, in terms of opportunity. And so how do we balance that? That's the, the two family homes to give renters opportunities. Um, we know that affordable housing is too small, that 12.4%. And so one of the next packages you're getting is bonus densities for affordable housing. I won't go through this all list, but I just wanted to show we think where, at least that's our goal, we're flowing from the principles about equity into the, the reality of climate change. So with that, what can I do to help? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fighting. <laughs> uh, hey, Wayne, could I ask you a question? Um, on Glendale Road, we're putting up that smaller home now in the front lot on Glendale Road. What is the size of that one? So the one that Habitat's doing? Yeah, that small one. Remember we had a big meeting on yeah. all the houses? I, I don't remember, Councilor. It's in the neighborhood of Half Acre, but I have to look that up. That's a perfect size. What fits the, it fits all of the lots nearby. Uh, Councillor Nash. Yeah, how, how did you know I was gonna raise my hand? You're psychic, man. <laughs> so uh, Wayne, how much, so in terms of the, the information you just provided us with, how much of this is embedded in the uh, sustainable Northampton plan and in like the, the recently um, uh, 
endorsed uh, resilience plan? So the principles we hope are certainly embedded in them. We use the same okay. language. We didn't, you know, we didn't do a demographic analysis. We didn't include that as part of it. Um, but certainly the principles are. Well, in, in, in that last slide, you were referencing that um, I didn't see, I could see how it related to the, the, the zoning proposals that are before us, um, but that, um, but those are direct, those are related to the resilience plan. And I think they're, they speak to some of the things we're trying to address here, right? Or yes, absolutely. I mean, I'll just I'll, I'll put this back up again. You notice again, this is the fine print. I don't expect you to master this, but you know, one of the things people yes, yes it's great. <laughs> but I just pointed a couple of data points. One of the things that people complained about is that two family homes are unaffordable. Um, because, and the reality is new construction is much more expensive than old construction. So new construction is going to be higher. But when we look at two families the average unit cost for two family, the way the assessors have it, is $114,000. The median cost of a single family home is $334,000. So the, the average value of a apartment in a two family unit is you know, basically a third of what it is in a single family. And the size is significantly smaller. So, you know, it's not just, I mean, yes, there's some very high end rentals in town, but the average one is smaller. And so that's, that's sort of it. That's the sort of analysis we do. That's the equity piece. You know, there will be some, I'm sure a million dollar condexes that get created, but on the average, two families are less expensive. And could I ask you a question, please? On where it's, oh, you just shut oh, it I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I can't see sorry you. you did. <laughs> I'll put it back up there. Thank you. Okay, where it says meet the demographic demand in all parts of the market, plus address equity by providing more rentals in each neighborhood. Lower medium price. I understand that. My question is, when you say providing more rentals in each neighborhood, I think that's great, but how do you control the rental price on it? That's my question. So for the two family, you don't. So we have a shortage of rentals in every level of the market, right? So when, you know, old school commons, went on the market, or New School Commons, whatever it's called, went on the market. It used to be rental, it went condo. We lost really high-end units. So we have a shortage of rentals at every level, whether it's you know doctors doing their residency at Bay State Medical or whether it's service workers. So we need all of them. Um, so partly we're trying to serve the market, right? There are a lot of people who want to rent and don't want to own. Uh, people under a certain age and people above a certain age in particular who want to rent. And then, so, so the short answer is we want to serve all parts of the market, but on the average, again, it's not every unit, on the average, two family homes are substantially less expensive and their rent is substantially less than one family. Not surprisingly, right? If I'm earning... <laughs> you know, a good salary and I want a single family home, I may not want somebody nearby. I don't want to hear them fight. I don't want, you know, I want to barbecue and have my own private yard, the, the you know, the classic house in the country. Um, so people that are two family homes, they're on the average are less expensive, not, not all of them. So th that's how we address that need. I, I just have concerns about that one. The, the about problem is how do we control, actually control the rental? Yeah, the problem is, if you control rental, people aren't gonna build the unit, even not even so much they can't get the rent. It is a pain, I mean, if you're controlling the rental, you're not just controlling the rental. You're gonna say, it's not just how much you charge, but you can only rent to somebody who's earning below a certain income. It is such a hassle that most landlords don't wanna go there. Most banks won't loan there. I mean, there's a reason if you look at our 12.4% affordable housing, the vast majority of those are owned by a few companies. People who are in the affordable housing business, 
right? Valley CDC, uh, um, Northampton Housing Authority, community builders, wayfinders, they know what they're doing. And, and there's others, they're private landlords as well. Um, but the person who has a house and wants to divide it in two, they're not gonna wanna deal with those regulations. So communities who've tried to do it, who say, let's do these, but only for rents below a certain amount, it ends up being those units don't get created. We have other things, the zoning packages. The next one, the one you're gonna see soon, a bonus density for affordable housing, those would only be for units with deed restrictions for people earning below a certain dollar. So that, that, that needs to be part of our overall package, but it's not. Absolutely. There are a lot of people earning more than the 50%, 60%, or 80% of area median income who are eligible for rent subsidies who still can't afford market rate units. We still want to create small units for them. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Councillor Nash, before I get to you, I don't see Jeff on, on the screen. I just want to make sure that if he wants I'm to here. Are I'm you also, yeah. I have no problem speaking up anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Councillor Nash. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, this is fascinating. And all of this data, we could probably talk for many, many, many hours. <laughs> this is really great. But in terms of the, 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 that, um, that home ownership is at 54%. And so roughly 45% is rental. And what we're talking about is shifting that even further, more towards, you know, from 54, pushing it downwards towards what number? What's the sweet spot? You know, the, the story I always tell is from 1950 to, nine, to 2000, Northampton's population didn't grow by a person. And then we've been in decline for 20 years. It, if we stop the decline, I would be happy. Right. So I don't know what the, that, I don't know what the healthy number is, but we continue to, use, to lose units. Um, we lose them, some units go condo, right? So, you know, uh, old school commons went condo. The uh, Clark School did not go condo and they can't because they're getting historic preservation tax credits. But if I was gonna predict, I would say 20 years from now when those tax credits run out, they're gonna go condo. Um, we continue to have two family homes that get converted to single family homes. So um, I don't know the answer. I don't really have a target, but I just wanted to stop declining. Wayne, why are people taking a two family and converting it to one? I don't, I don't understand that. So the average family, the average family size at the end of World War II was almost five people, and the average dwelling unit size was um, about 1,200 square feet. In the, the time since World War II, family size has been cut in half, and dwelling size has doubled. So the short answer is people are combining them because they can. They have the money, and the first thing you do when you have money is you give yourself more space. So it's understandable. I mean, you certainly in, you know, in, in John's neighborhood, you know, Council Thorpe's neighborhood, you see a lot of those old homes that were once two families have been converted back to, to single families. Now. You know, our, our accessory dwelling unit project, which we've been allowing after 30 years, has been fabulously successful. It's, it's one of our most successful areas at creating lower rent homes. So no deed de controls. But some significant number of those, a minority, but some significant number are guest bedrooms, right? I have money. My kids are going to come back and visit me. I don't want to give them a bedroom in my house because I love them, but I don't love them that much. I still want them to be in their separate unit out there with their own kitchen and their own bathroom so I don't see them. Um, so, you know, even when you have two kitchens, some people are doing it, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not critical of that whatsoever. People should get the space they want, but I'm just, we're trying to balance it in, in new unit creation. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nash. So, in, so we've seen a conversion towards turning two families into single families. How often do we see that, see that reverse back the other way? And, and if we saw that switch on a more regular basis, that would actually be okay. A family gets bigger and then, you know, the kids leave the house and it contracts and then it goes back to it. How often do we see that kind of switch? 
I don't have good numbers, not often. Again, we're seeing a lot of accessory dwelling units being created. That's sort of the same thing. You add an extra unit out there. Right. Um, sometimes an expansion science dividing up space, but very few. So it's a pretty small number out there. Huh. That was going to be my argument to support it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the practical challenges we get, and this is this is one of the biggest challenges for affordable housing generally, is you know, a lot of the cost is in the bedroom and the kitchen. So, you know, dividing a house up into two units is fabulously expensive. It might be cheaper just to build a new unit than to convert the unit out there. And this is, you know, I'm a big advocate for small homes and we have, you know, one of the packages you'll be looking at is incentives for smaller dwelling units. But the reality is one of the reasons we don't see small, more small units is you still need a kitchen and you still need a bathroom and so the savings, you know, going from an 1,800 square foot home to a 1,200 square foot home saves you money, but not as much as you think, because you still need that kitchen. Uh, Councilor Nash. Okay, we're really getting in the weeds here. But so Wayne, in terms of, and, and I, I think it'll relate later to uh, uh, Jackie Balance's uh, discussion, that um, so what's the idea, what is that piece that we're missing in our, um, in our housing? You know, so that, you know, studios, one family, two fam, or, or one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, you know, now you're starting to get into a single family house. What, what is the, what's the missing piece there? And in my mind, I, and I'm just guessing at this, it's, it's the three bedroom and that, um, that, that that's the one where, you know, where you can really target a, a young family. Cause those are the folks that I'm hearing, like, I, I, I can't live here because I can't find a place, yeah. but, but I don't know what, what is that? And, and what is the square footage of that? Yeah, so I'm rusty cause I, it's been a while, but when we did our housing needs assessment, which is probably six years ago. So it's not the most accurate. You're absolutely right. Three, three bedrooms was identified as one of the biggest gaps that are out there for, for family formations. Um, I, you know, you can do modest units. I mean, you think about sort of all the homes built by KV properties between Florence Road and Ryan Road in the 1950s and 60s. And those were, you know, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 square foot units. And a lot of them were three bedrooms. You can do a smaller unit that's smaller than the median home being built. This is an opposite data point. So one of the reasons that we've been strongly encouraging one bedrooms and efficiency apartments studios is it's interesting, you know, we want us, we, I think we're all sympathetic to people who are homeless on the streets and how do we deal with that? But of course we also get complaints about, you know, whatever noise, trash, whatever. It's interesting to us that we have been successful, mostly our partners and we're supporting our partners in this at creating a lot of units which have been targeted to people who were homeless or at risk of homeless. And for all the complaints we get about people who are homeless, there is virtually zero complaints, not zero. I mean, you know, there's some in your ward, Jim, so maybe you hear some, Councilor Nash. But the number of complaints we get for, for people who were homeless for living in units is almost zero. And you think about the resources it takes to, you know, it's, China is more expensive to support people who are homeless than it is to support them in homes. So those one bedrooms and those efficiencies are really important to me, at least, as how do we actually break that cycle? How do we get people who are homeless into houses? So it may be there are more people looking for three bedrooms, but that's sort of the ones that sort of creates some of our biggest challenges. Councillor Nash, I you don't have to keep raising your hand. I think you're just going to continually go and just. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, eight 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 point seven percent of our population identifies as Hispanic or Latinx, and I I just it always strikes me how uh, we underserve that particular community, and I I'm wondering if you could just expound on your thoughts on that, Director Feiden. Um, I mean, I... 
Three yeah. things we should be doing. I, there is a, there's social inequity there. I, I, I feel like we just don't recognize that, um, that that particular community is here and, and, and include them. And, um, it, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, the reality is populations who are more marginal, where, where people have to work two jobs or people are suffering, are less likely to take part in city government and are less visible to a lot of us. So I, I, I think that's the reality. I think downtown has been very successful, but in being successful, it becomes a more luxury market. And so it's less likely to attract some of those populations. So again, they're, they're less visible. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned this last time I was here, but sort of one of our data points that got us concerned was the Commonwealth had a grant, still has a grant called Urban Agenda, um, which is focused on um, Black and Latino entrepreneurs. And um, the city passed on applying it because we couldn't find partners. And you, you need to find partners, right? You can't, you can't just tell people we need this. And we couldn't find partners um, in the, the Black and Latino community who were sort of willing to take the lead in doing it. So, you know, we, we lost a few years ago when um, Casa Latina folded, you know, sort of became part of um, community action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's an issue. It is an underserved population with, with deep needs out there. Um, a lot of really good individual projects. I, you know, this isn't, community action is a fabulous job, but we, we haven't figured out sort of the breaking cycle part. Of it. So fostering more organizations like Casa Latina would be helpful it would, would help partner, we, what we need is partners for this, is what you're saying, and that fostering that would be productive. Absolutely. Okay. Councilor Barge. Yeah, Casa Latina now, that is associated strictly only with community action. Community action took that over about what, Wayne, a year ago or so? Yeah, something like that, a little bit longer, I think. Right. So they are no longer up in Florence that I do know. It's right with community action. And I think with uh, Mary Claire Higgins, she's doing an excellent job with Casa Latina. That was a big step for community action to help them. And we really honor community action for doing that. That's right. And, and, and I'll add, you know, both community action and Valley Community Development Corporation have in their bylaws including people on their board who are representing the populations that they serve. So it's not that, that the populations we're talking about don't have representatives who are speaking up for them in those, those forms, but it's still not the same thing. You know, Constantino once complained to us because every time we were doing outreach, we reached out to them. And they right. said, you know, we can't be your token Latino representatives, but the reality is there weren't a lot of other groups to go to. We, we yeah, and we need to find more of those groups to work with. Right. Any other members? Now, Wayne, I'm not letting you go just yet. I believe you, you, you with your slide presentation, you, you covered the census data that we were going to go over, and you kind of went into the equity considerations that, am I mistaken, that what we had lined up, you kind of already brought that into the mix? Hope so. Yes. No, go. <laughs> okay. So... I would like to move on to Jackie Ballant's proposal and uh, have a little uh, discussion around that. Um, were you able to review that? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of things that, and I think Jackie said this in her comments mm -hmm. to you, there's some things we can't legally do. So we can't, it's very clear, and, and Alan's on the call, he can notice this better than I can, but we can't limit the size of a resident of a single family home. Um, we can, we think, you know, and, and we're see if someone ever challenges us, we think we can incentivize it so that the proposed zoning that's created, that's what we're calling half scale units, would give you extra bonus density. They basically let you have twice as many units if you make them really small. We think we can do that. We've been doing accessory apartments for 30 years. So we couldn't limit the size. We also have always understood that we need to give people a, a path to absolute as of right development, which means not even, even having site plan approval. So right now, if you're doing over 2000 square feet of construction, 
other than for a single family home, you need to come before the planning board for site plan approval. Site plan approval looks at projects for details, trees, landscaping, you know, driveways, all that sort of stuff. We don't look at single family homes. I think it's the same thing here. We don't get to decide whether single family homes fall on the, the, the site plan criteria unless we're giving extra stuff, you know, extra bonus dents. Um, so so that's, that's the stuff we can't do. Uh, what, and again, Jackie said this in her remarks, there are certainly promise, and we're gonna continue to work on this in site plan approval to get projects that do work better in different areas. Um, this is always a debate, how far do we wanna go on, on standards here where we added some design standards five years ago when counselor, counselor reduced the, the lot size required in URB and URC. We're adding some additional design standards as part of the two family homes. Um, so, and how far we, you know, we used to not have any historic districts. Now we have some historic districts. We have an architecture, two architecture districts. So we do have some mechanisms when there's consensus as a community. And last comment, I don't want to talk too long, but um, the trend in Northampton for 30 years now has been we have reduced the requirement for special permits. Special permits are permits, I'm oversimplifying before Alan yells at me, but special permits are permits where board can say no to. You know, is this use good or bad? We leave it to a board. But what we've been doing is we added site plan approval 32 years ago, and we've been beefing it up. So we're doing less and less of we're going to say no to a project and more and more, but we're going to give you conditions. We're going to make sure it works in the neighborhood. And that part of Jackie's proposal, so that's not in the details in the weeds, but a bigger piece of the details, I absolutely think that's the right direction for us to go. Attorney Seawald, would you like to add anything? Be happy to. Um, you know, the, the under state law and under the case law, we have to have at least one substantial use as of right in every district. We can't condition all uses on special permit. So, um, you know, historically, that use in most districts, particularly in residential districts, would be the single family residence. As I said in my email earlier, um, you know, the, the indirect restriction on building size through traditional zoning mechanisms such as, you know, setbacks, um, floor, area, floor area ratios, um, lot coverage limitations. Those are traditional uh, zoning uh, mechanisms and they have the effect of reducing the permissible size of a house on a lot, but it has to be in relation to the, to the size of the lot. It's not a direct limitation on the size of the single family dwelling. And I did get a, a, the a response email from uh, Ms. Valens uh, that this is a not a limitate, not a cap, but a but a trigger for site plan approval. Understand that site plan approval is a process that attaches to uses that are allowed as of right, and it's intended to give the board an opportunity to improve the project, but not the discretion to deny it. So. Uh, when we move to a trigger for site plan approval, it's no longer a cap. Now it's just a trigger for some process to review. And in that sense, um, it really wouldn't function in a way that would allow the city to um, limit the size of houses or deny large houses. Now, um, you know, as I understood Ms. Balance's original proposal, this, you know, fit proposal, um, you know, there were other issues that I had concerns about that proposal, and I'm not sure if that's still on the table, but, you know, for instance, pegging, um, you know, looking at the history of a builder's uh, previous buildings and determining how often they exceed what Zillow has for a value of relative to the neighborhood or something of that sort. Uh, I want to caution that Zoning is always about the land use. It's never about the land user. So you really can't look at a builder and say, well, this builder builds big houses. We're gonna treat this builder differently than we treat a different builder who builds smaller houses coming before us. Uh, and so I just wanna caution that we never look at who the 
the applicant is. We only look at the land use in the application. Um, and then of course I have, you know, problems with, um, uh, you know, the idea that Zillow would somehow be an authoritative measure of, of how we determine value. Uh, I, I have to say that, you know, Wayne, Wayne and I did speak about this earlier today. And, you know, while I haven't raised um, issues about uh, two dwellings, you know, allowing an additional dwelling so long as both dwellings are limited in their size, it does raise some issues. I mean, I think it's an innovative approach and I'm willing, you know, as I, uh, I've said about other matters that come before this, uh, this committee, if the worst that we can find out is that some judge tells us we can't do this, I can live with that. Um, you know, I'm happy to be innovative and, and you know, see what sticks, but I do have my concerns about that. Be, and and uh, unlike the accessory dwelling unit where you have an unrestricted initial dwelling that could be any size and you're granting um, bonus density for a, uh, a unit that's restricted in size, um, this, is res this proposal restricts both dwelling units. So in that sense, you are, um, you, you know, we would be um, directly restricting the size of a single family dwelling. And the question of whether, you know, the extra, uh, the extra unit is an offset for that and somehow um, uh, assuages that, that uh, impermissibility uh, is yet to be determined. I don't know whether it does or not. So, um, you know, I, I applaud Ms. Balance's, you know, um, approach to this and desire to bring down prices um, and, um, and, you know, to, to uh, uh, encourage energy efficiency and, and sustainability. But uh, I'm not sure that zoning is the way that we're going to be able to do this. Uh, at least as, as zoning is, is uh, uh, interpreted in our state right now. Uh, I know that, Ch uh, that Chillmark has, uh, has a trigger for site plan approval over a certain size house, um, but I would caution that uh, the SJC has treated Martha's Vineyard very differently. You know, for instance, Marth uh, Edgartown has some areas that have three acre zoning and, um, you know, the SJC indicated that because it is such a, a fragile, you know, environment there and it's an island and, and uh, they look at it a little differently and that they would look askew at a, a place like Northampton requiring three acre zoning. Um, so I, I just caution not to, you know, I, I am aware of Chillmark's um, site plan approval over uh, over a certain square footage of house. Uh, but I believe that is also pegged in some way to the size of the lot. So it's really all I have to say about, uh, uh, unless there are questions. Thank you, Attorney Seawald. Thank you. Uh, members from the committee, can't see. I know Jim Nash had his hand up earlier. I'm not sure if he still has his hand up. I don't know where he is. I don't see him on the call anymore. I don't know. Assume. Assume. Was that that boring? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, apologize. I don't know where he went. And uh, <laughs> okay. Megan, you have any questions? Right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay, seeing none, Mr. Fiden, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and uh, for helping us and, and, and it was greatly appreciated. So I, I do thank you and the, the, thank the you. committee thanks you. Thank you all, have good work. Okay. Moving next on the agenda, we have organization disposition of topics already reviewed and we have buckets number one, two and three that we can take a look at. And also I'd like to thank Laura Krutzler for putting this together and keeping track of all of this. It's greatly appreciated, Laura, so thank you. So 
So if we have additions to hmm. these two spreadsheets, okay. Um, do should we raise them in the meeting, or, or it depends on if there's substantial substance changes or grammatical. So let's do. Is there anything in bucket number? And I would like to hear from Attorney Seawall too, because I do know that we had everything condensed and and. Um, but you have some changes you'd like to add in, Megan. Yeah, sure. Okay. Do we want to start with bucket number one? Okay. Oh, Laura, Laura's going to hand I just, up. I just see in the chat that Jim Nash te texted me to say, can you let folks know I needed to run to the central business architecture meeting on the St. John Cantius church. <laughs> okay. Learned his whereabouts, excuse me. Okay. So Megan, where would you like to? Okay, so actually what we're calling bucket number three. Okay. Which um, for our listeners is um, what a category of um, ordinance or poss uh, ordinances um, that do not currently exist in Northampton, but have been proposed by um, the general public or other counselors or by members of this committee. Um, so they include, there are eight currently on this list um, and they'd include the, the set of um, two families by right ordinances um, that Wayne Biden just talked about. Um, so on, I just noticed that the fair chance ordinance is one that we discussed, I wanna say maybe in our November, yep. November 11th meeting, when we had um, the Northampton Housing Partnership visit. Um, and that was, uh, you know, because it was proposed by a member of the public, Tate Porco. Um, and um, I had shared with the committee a, a toolkit for Fair Chance Ordinance. Um, that has been implemented in other cities. So I think that, so this is, this currently not the, um, this row here is blank right now. The, the purpose and the, the committee action. And, you know, to my recollection, I think we um, referred it back to the housing partnership for further study. But the gist of our discussion was that it may not have been, um, may not be appropriate for Northampton. And I don't know. Uh, the fair chance, if I'm not mistaken, I'd also, I, I'd also like to hear um, if Attorney Seawald knows it, but if I'm not mistaken, the fair chance ordinance, the cities that have implemented the fair chance ordinance were not in Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. This is something that's outside the state of Massachusetts and Massachusetts has its own, um, uh, I don't think it would be, it could be implemented here in the state. Um, and I think some of the, the, the fair chance ordinances could have been like Minneapolis or California. Um, am I mistaken? Attorney Seawalt, do you want to? So just for those who are, uh, tuning in, um, you know, this is, and I believe we were talking about prohibiting landlords from accessing um, um, criminal history. And if, I, if I'm remembering correctly off the, off the top of my head. That was one. And, you know, we, we have a, a state Corey law, criminal offender record information law. And, you know, I actually spent the day um, uh, studying this very topic because we've had some public records requests that implicate the Cory law. And, you know, the, the legislature, when, when the Cory law was first enacted, um, um, 
the the only parties that had access to criminal offender record information were um, public uh, law enforcement agencies, and um, it really was at the behest of um, landlords and employers that they became a tiered system of access to Corey information. Um, and and you know since 2010, I believe it's been um, uh, amended uh, to provide specifically provide landlords and employers access to Corey information. And I'm very concerned about um, you know uh, the ability of the city to somehow change or or uh, 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 render the the changes to the Corey law that are statewide. I mean, the Corey law is the essence of uh, occupying the field. Uh, as you recall, we talked about that. Um, you know, this is a statewide law that is the same in every city and town. Having said that, I would all I would say that um, you know this is something that the city council really, if, if the committee really wanted to recommend to the city council and the city council really wanted to proceed on. I would have to consider whether it would uh, engender any liability to the city. And if not, it would probably fall into one of those unknown situations. I don't know whether it's outside the ability of the city to implement, um, but I would tell you that I would fully expect a landlord to challenge it. Uh, and, um, you know, again, if a judge, if, if all I'm opening us up to is a judge saying, you can't do that, fine. But I have grave concerns about its its validity because the Corey Law is, um, you know, a, a statewide law that applies equally in the same in every jurisdiction in the state. And the, the legislature has specifically opened it up to landlords just, you know, within the last decade, specifically, uh, granted landlords access to uh, some quarry information on a tiered system. We lost Jeff as well. Jeff? Yeah, he's, I don't see him here. Maybe he's interested in St. John's Cancius can oh. also. Another one. Okay. Laura? He also texted, small emergency at home, we'll be right back. Okay. Um, I keep, right, I keep driving people away. I'm going to start taking it personally. Yeah. We're going to have to recruit um, Councillor Jarrett, who's still with us uh, any, any minute now. To... Maybe Jackie Balance wants to be on the committee. Uh, um, so, Megan, what were you yeah, going to say? And so, yeah, Councillor Thorpe, um, I'm just looking through the minutes of that, uh, that meeting. And um, the cities that have implemented this are Definitely not Massachusetts. Uh, com, uh, municipalities are Seattle, Washington, D.C., New York. Right. So, um, and also. California you know, also has a statewide law prohibiting employers from uh, accessing criminal uh, uh, history information. Sorry, where? California. California. Yeah. Again, I mean, if the. So we, we had, there was some discussion that ensued about how, I, like our, our interest in limiting the use of criminal records and housing applications. Um, but the, we also have the issue here of have, you know, the, of how much um, control the, the rental agencies have on our, on our market. Um, so one of the, remedies propose um, having you know portable screening report that applicants can use with multiple landlords um, that that also wouldn't wouldn't apply here in Northampton because we we can't really do much about the the civil relationship between uh, we, we can't really do much about uh, the um, eliminating rental agency fees or, or transferring them from tenant, potential tenant to, to the landlord. So, so anyway, um, so I just wanted to like, 
I just want to say that I think we that has been that has been discussed, and we don't really foresee that as a recommendation going forward. The fair chance and fair chance ordinance. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Somebody, if, if I may. Yes, attorney. I, I believe at the last meeting, um, there was talk about sort of um, collapsing uh, bucket two and three. Buckets two and three. And, you know, after reviewing this, you know, I, I, I'm and, and thinking about drafting the, uh, um, uh, you know, drafting uh, the report, I, I really don't. I, I I don't intend unless the, the committee really wants me to. I don't intend um, to, you know, separate the you know them be in these buckets. I mean, I think that housekeeping is housekeeping, and that's you know always mm -hmm. in these reports as something that's just you know we need word changes. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I think the idea of collapsing yeah. them is a good one, and mm -hmm. I was wondering whether Laura could just put together one spreadsheet of all of these proposals and you know merge these two buckets. Uh, the, my, my other uh, interest here, and I'm sorry that uh, we're down to uh, three, three members here because I would love to have everybody's uh, um, thoughts on whether we have covered, whether there are any that are missing. I mean, because I, you know, I remember uh, at some point and maybe I missed it in here. We talked about alarm fees and we talked about, you know, not that I really think that, uh, you know, marginalized communities have a huge problem with alarm fees, but- um, um, I think that is- um, Is that in bucket two? Yeah. Okay. No, I think it was on here. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that, it, that all of that, that none of the members have other, um, uh, ordinance proposals that that you know are not reflected here uh, and because I would like to take a stab at, at a real preliminary first draft for your next meeting in a week mm -hmm. so I just want to make sure we have everything uh, here so that I can start doing that I'm just looking over one of the I, I haven't actually, I was intending to do that, go through the minutes. And I don't, I don't think this is a, probably the most comprehensive list. Do you feel like you need to have one before you get started? Or can we just continue this discussion at the next meeting? We can certainly continue the discussion. Um, I just don't want to, uh, you know, I, I would like to have a, it's most efficient if I have a complete list uh, you know, a complete spreadsheet of all of the ordinances that I need to address when I'm writing this, uh, writing this report. So, you know, I can hold off for one more meeting. And, um, but what I would like to do at, at the next meeting, uh, for sure, is have a, um, you know, have everyone agree that this is the universe of ordinances mm -hmm. that the committee has discussed. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you for that, Attorney Sewell. Laura, would you, you, you will be able to condense everything. Yes. And then be able to send it to us before the next meeting. Yes. If any of the count, if anything we see, we send notice to you. Sounds have it good. included. Yeah. And the false alarm is on bucket number one, housekeeping okay. changes, because originally we had specific language that was being proposed. And then Megan, I think you had mentioned wanting to review it more for whether it has a disproportionate impact. So um, right. it's on there with the specific language that we'd originally mm -hmm. thought of, but then I, right. yeah, so I, that's still a question, I guess, whether you did we want to- right. We never had any uh, input from the, the fire department on that. And right. so I, I think it was dropped sometime right. last calendar year. Okay. Um, and I don't know at this point if it's, we want to, you know, pursue new ordinances for review. 
So I think it's important that we go through this and know exactly what's going to be in my report and what's not, or in your report and what's not going to be in your report. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that uh, I was concerned about, there were at least one thing that was sent to the planning board that I'm not sure ever came back. Mm -hmm. Um, That's number three. There were two things, and I think they're supposed to be at the planning board's first meeting in March. There was Jim Nash's, Councilor Nash's proposal to expand the notification for map right, changes, right, and then right, there was right. the parking, the towing of vehicles. Of, yeah, of the parking regulations mm -hmm. on so having disproportionately impacting renters and just their thoughts. Right. On that. That's not the towing of vehicles. That's something. That's something else. Uh, oh, the towing of vehicles. Uh, planning. Are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I thought that was DPW's issue. That's also DPW's issue. I think Carolyn had said that was going to be on their agenda. Their okay. In March. So. So maybe I'll hold off and see what they do, and hopefully we'll have you know. Uh, well, the our next meeting is on next the, week. It is, and is that the first of March? Yeah, it is. So the planning board will not have reviewed that at that point. But I'll I'll, I'll try. So, um, so I'll hold off until after our next meeting, so that I know that you know we have had a chance to review all of this. So, Laura, you'll still have that list condensed and provided yes. to before the yeah, next. Yeah, that's meeting. pretty easy. This way, Just every all the committee it. members can look at it. It's yeah. clear to me what has been discussed, but not really what our final recommendation would be. Right. So this is the other thing that's missing from here. And we do need to go over that as well, because I think we're more sure about what we're not going to recommend, because there are certain ordinances that have don't actually exist, or like the right. Trans Act um, do not apply to Northampton. But I'm really unsure how we're going to go about recommending the ones we feel more positive about. Like, what if, you know, then that's something, that's a discussion we need to have too before Ernie Seawall can get go further in his report. Mm -hmm. um, like, what do we think about the um, ordinances that, <laughs> the Tanzoni ordinances, two families by right? Um, but I would actually like to have more of our members present. When we, when we do that, maybe if we could put that on the agenda for the next, next meeting. meeting, which is next week. Next week. Council Barge, would you like to be heard? No. Okay. Sounds good. I, you know, and now looking back on the on the alarms. That's that is a housekeeping. It has nothing to do with uh, marginalized communities. It's just housekeeping because there were some inconsistencies in it. And well, so, maybe not exact that exact ordinance. Apologies, interrupting. But it's the related ordinances in that chapter. I think this is quite a while ago, but I can probably reconstruct that rationale if we need to. But but then again, I, I just feel like there's no. Um, it's not going to, the review of that's not going to happen in the next six months here. So, okay. Unless that's something we want to, you know, bring up for further study or uh, okay. just nuisance laws. Or, or I don't know what that would fall into the category that we're trying to. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the bucket will be con combined. Um, we've already went into the continuation of the discussion of the final report. We still need to have a discussion, but we need to have all members here regarding that. So that will be at the next meeting, which leaves us with our last item, which is motion to adjourn. Unless anyone else has anything else to say. Motion. Second. Second. Okay. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Member Peck. Yes. 
Okay. Meetings. Good night, all.